Today I'm dealing with another aspect of identity theft, and that is the identity theft of God himself, and how his identity has been stolen by so many in our culture. Acts chapter 17 is where we are. That's page 943. If you use one of the Holman Bibles in the pew rack, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together? It's inspired. It's infallible. It's inerrant. Here's what God says. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. Not saved, but religious. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim or declare to you. Now may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Have you ever talked to somebody who had a really different view of God than you do? They start talking and they say, here's what I believe about God. And as they begin to explain their view of God, suddenly the warning buzzers go off. Warning, Will Robinson. Warning, Will Robinson. Because you know that what they're saying is not biblical and it's not true. Some people have literally stolen God's biblical identity. They've robbed him of his identity in the Word of God and they've made him into something that he never intended to be. And most of the time, here's the problem. We try to make God in our image rather than being conformed to his image, which is exactly what he wants. And so there's a problem out there today. And we're left with this burning question, who is God? I mean, really, who is God? And what is God really, truly like? Can we really know? Well, apparently that was the topic of discussion at Mars Hill. All the philosophers had met in Athens at Mars Hill, and they debated on a daily basis who God is or who the gods, little g, really were. And they had erected all these statues to various gods that they worshipped, and there were dozens of them because they had Greek mythology and Roman mythology, and they had all this multiplicity of gods. And they worshipped all these gods. Each one had its own statue. And then, just to be sure, they covered all their bases. They erected one last statue that simply said to an unknown God. Now, I believe when I read that, that there was something inside these men that cried out and said, all these other gods leave something to be desired. There's something still lacking. There must be some unknown God out there. And they built a statue, and it was to the glory and to the commemoration of the unknown God. Now, this morning, I want us to think about what we believe, what we know, what we think, about God. Now why is that important? A.W. Tozer, the great writer, said this, what comes to mind when we think about God, listen to this, is the most important thing about us. What comes to mind when we think about God? The most revealing fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. However you picture God in your mind will affect your life. And not only your life here, but your life hereafter as well. And so you and I definitely need to make sure we have the right take on the right God. His identity is at stake. And if you go to Barnes & Noble or if you turn on the Discovery Channel or the History Channel, I promise you, you're going to see a lot of cases where God's identity has been stolen in our culture. I want to share three things with you this morning because I are Baptist. Amen. Three things. Number one, the denial of God. The denial of God. There are many people in our world who deny the very existence of God. And they say there's no evidence anywhere there really is a God. That's what the cosmonaut said when he was shot into space early on in the space program. He said, I see no evidence of God anywhere, anywhere when I look out the window of this spaceship. Other people say, well, if there is a God, why doesn't he stop all the pain and all the suffering and all the sickness in our world? There can't be a God because there's so much travail in our world. And then there are those who simply just say, I don't know. They deny God. And regardless of how they deny God, they've really stolen his identity because the Bible affirms there is a God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Now, one group of these people that deny God are called atheists. We know about them. The word theist means a believer in God. If you put an A in front of that word, it negates it, and it means a non-believer in God. Somebody that believes there is no God at all. 2.5% of the world's population literally are atheists right now. 4% of the people in the U.S. profess to be atheists. If you read the media or watch the news, you'd think it was 94%. But it's only 4% that are truly atheists in our culture in the United States of America. Now, do you know what the Bible says about atheists? Those who deny the very existence of God... Here's what it says in Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Guess what Psalm 53, verse 1 says? The very same thing. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Not in his mind, but in his what? Heart. In his heart. There is no God. The Bible calls them fools. Now one day, an atheist said, I wish we had a national holiday in America. And the person on the other end of that conversation said, we already do, April 1st. Because that's April what? Fool's Day. And the Bible says these people are fools. Now, why would the Bible say such a thing about mortal human beings, living, breathing people created in the image of God? Why would God call them fools not once but twice? I believe it's simply because they're acting foolishly. They are denying all the evidence that's all around us that there must be a God, there must be a creator, there must be a mastermind. They're turning their back on all the evidence so abundant. And they say there is no God. There's a law in science called the law of causality. The law of causality says everything that comes to be must have a cause. And that's very, very true. Just look around this sanctuary and everything you see has a cause. These decorations, they had a cause, right? This watch I'm wearing, it has a cause. This coat that I'm wearing had a cause. Somebody had to cause these things to be. You know what the atheists would say to us? We bring up the law of causality. They would say, well, if that's true, then who caused God? If everything that comes to be has a cause, then who calls God? Well, the key to that little phrase is come to be. You see, God never came to be. God has always been, and God always will, and He's above the law of causality. But everything else around us, everything in the universe, including we ourselves, we did come to be. And there's got to be a cause. I can prove to you that there is a God this morning. Did you know that? And I can prove to you there's only one God. I can prove that to you. And here's how. The law of causality. If you go far enough back and you look at all the things around us that had a cause and you keep going back further and further, for example, this stand for a lifeguard, it's made out of wood. Well, where did the wood come from? Who cut the wood? Who prepared the wood? Who put the wood in the forest? Who made the trees? If you go back far enough, there's got to be an uncaused cause somewhere. Somebody who caused all this stuff that eventually comes down to what we see around us, all this evidence, all these things around us. And there can only be one uncaused cause because if there's more than one, then you've got to figure out who caused the other uncaused cause. Are you with me? Right? There can only be one ultimate uncaused cause that started everything and everything was caused after that by people, individuals, minds, and all of the other. But there's got to be an uncaused cause somewhere, and there can literally only be one. And I believe according to the Word of God, that uncaused cause is God Almighty. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, the God of our faith, the God that we serve. And to deny that there is a God as an atheist is to steal his identity, to say that he doesn't exist. There's another group of people in the same category who deny God. And these are the agnostics. Now I call these the junior varsity atheists because basically they're only one step away from atheism. And the agnostic says, well, there may be a God. But if there is, we can't know for sure. And if there is, we can't really know him personally. That's stealing the identity of the God of the Bible. Because if there's one thing I understand about the God of the Bible, He wants to be known. He wants us to know Him. 
That's why he sends the prophets. That's why he sent his son. That's why he inspired men to put pen to parchment and record his very words, not only his words, but his thought and his intent and his purpose in the infallible word of God that we carry in our hands today. God wants to be known. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, guess what? He came looking for them. And he said, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? He wanted Adam to know him again, even though he had sinned against him. And he wanted Eve to know him again, even though she had sinned against him and broken the one commandment they had in the Garden of Eden. And so God wants to be known. He wants us to know him. That's why he's displayed his majesty in this world around us. Next week, I'm going to be at the Cove in Asheville. And I look forward to going to the Cove because those beautiful mountains are there. I don't necessarily care for Asheville that much, but I want you to know I care about those mountains. They're beautiful. And you can see God's handiwork. It declares the glory of Almighty God. That can't happen by accident. That can't happen by happenstance. There had to be purpose. There had to be a designer behind the design. And that designer is God. He's displayed His handiwork in creation. He's given us a conscience so that we can know the difference between right and wrong to draw us to Himself. We know we're wrong. We need a Redeemer. There's something inside of man that cries out, I need something bigger than I am. I need somebody to worship. And even at Mars Hill, they were worshiping all these different gods, little g. And even the unknown God, that missing part of the equation in their lives back in those days. That's also why God has given us His Word, that we may know Him and that He may make Himself known to us in an intimate and personal way. I heard a story not long ago about a little girl, who, and she and her dad were on the floor, and they had those blocks with letters on them. Remember those? And they were writing words and phrases, and the dad spelled out this, God is nowhere. And the little girl knew how to spell, and that bothered her. And she took the N-O-W off the front of nowhere and shifted it over, and it became a whole different phrase. God is now here. God is now here. I want you to know we don't serve a God who's nowhere. We serve a God who's now here. And He's here this morning through His spoken Word and also through the Holy Spirit that will take that Word of God and apply it to your heart and to my heart. God is not a nowhere God, but a now here God. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. Not only do people deny God, but also there are distortions about God. Some people do say there is no God or if there is, we can't know Him. We can't know for sure if He's out there. And others say, well, I believe in God. But you can't take that at face value any longer. Because you need to ask them, well, which God are you talking about? What God are you professing? Because there are all kinds of gods out there. There's only one true and living God, yes, to be sure. But there are many distortions about God. Let me share with you just a few of those distortions that are common. And maybe you have one of these distortions in your mind. If you do, this is the place to be because you can change that. And you can know the true and the living God this morning, the real God, the God of the Bible. Some people picture God as an ugly, vindictive, angry God. And God can get angry. God does get angry in the Word of God. But the reason He gets angry is because He's not an ugly God. It's simply because He hates sin and what sin does to people. How it robs people of life and vitality and purpose and even eternity. And he hates sin and he gets angry about sin. But there are people who read those passages in the Bible or hear about them. And they say, well, if God is that mad and he's vindictive and he's ugly and angry, I don't want to serve God. Because if I serve that God and I commit my life to him, I can never laugh again. I can never smile again. Because if he's that mean and ugly, he's looking down over the portals of glory. And if I smile, he'll say, thou shalt not smile. Thou shalt not laugh. Behold, thou art in church. Don't laugh. And if I do get really tickled, and I just sit there on the pew shaking, trying to control it, he's going to reach down and squish me like a cockroach. Because he's mean and he's ugly. If you believe that, somebody's stolen 
God's identity in your life. Because this God, the God of the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Bible says this, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's God speaking. And God, to say that, wouldn't be mean and ugly and vindictive. An ugly, rotten God just waiting to squash us. He's not like that at all. In fact, I've got to tell you, I lived 20 years without Christ in my life. And I thought I was having a great time. I had friends. I worked in radio. I enjoyed life. I had a nice-looking van with American flag curtains and mag wheels on it. I had long hair. I looked like Samson come back to life. I thought I was happy. But you know what? I did not understand what real joy was until I met the giver of joy. And then I discovered there's something deeper in life, and I still laugh. Every morning when I look in the mirror, I go, oh, man, Lord, whoa, you know, I still laugh. We have actually been out in fellowship, our church, I'm not going to mention any names, some of you here this morning, and we've actually been called down because we were too rowdy. We were laughing too much. One time in the hospital it happened, as a matter of fact, with Mr. Thompson over there, and they called us down. They said, you guys are being too loud. You're laughing too much. I want to tell you, when you get saved, that's when you begin to laugh. And really have joy deep in your heart. Well, here's another distortion about God. Some people picture God as old and tired and worn out. Like a really old, old person. Now, I want to tell you something. He has been around a long time. God is old. The Bible says He's the ancient of days. He is old, older than the universe. But this God has not lost one iota of his power. He's not changed his mind about sin. He's not in heaven's Brian Center, okay? He is still alive and well, and he's still very much involved in his world. He's still God with a capital G, and to say anything else about him is to steal his identity. Here's another one, distortion about God. Some people seem to think that God is a glorified man. That's what our Mormon friends believe. I hear people saying all the time, Mormons are just a branch of Christianity because they worship God. And they have the Bible, but they also have other books. Caution, warning, danger, Will Robinson, danger. And here's what they believe about God literally. Their literature says this. They say as a man is, God once was. Did you catch that? As man is, God once was. And as God now is, man can become. That's literally saying that God, their God, is a glorified man. He once was a man, and somehow through Mormonism and all the steps of Mormonism, he scaled the heights and found exaltation and became a God. Joseph Smith said this. He's the founder of Mormonism, you know. When you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom, that's good, and ascend step by step until you arise at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel, their gospel, not our gospel. You must begin with the first step and go on until you learn the principles of exaltation, which literally means they become God. I was in the hospital last week and uh, had a few problems. They just took off too much fluid on the Friday previous to that and... Uh, about four or five pounds too much and uh, my potassium level went down and my electrolytes went out and uh, wound up having to go to the hospital to get some treatment. And while I was there on Sunday morning, I was trying to find something on television and I found one or two good gospel programs. You know what? There are not a lot of good gospel programs on Sunday morning anymore. Really, they're not. One or two, that's about it. And then I found a movie and it was about a Mormon guy who had multiple wives. And one of the wives decided she wanted to rebel and she was going to cut her hair. And he said, you can't cut your hair because when I go to heaven, you've got to take your hair and wash my feet. Now I want to tell you something. What he was telling her is, I'm going to be God. And you're going to bow before me and you're going to wash my feet with your hair. Just like Mary did with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's identity theft, folks. 
That's not the God of the Bible. So don't tell me Mormons have the same God we do. They don't. It's totally different. And then there's the Islamic God, Allah. And I hear people all the time, they say, well, Pastor Buddy, you know, don't be too hard on the Islamic folks because they serve the same God. They just call him by a different name. And the word Allah just means God. You know what? The God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. Did you hear me? The God of Muslims is not the God of Christians. I can prove it to you this morning. First of all, Allah never had a son. Never did. The Bible says God the Father had a son, God the Son. His name is Jesus Christ. Do you know that in Islamic law, there's something called shirk, S-H-I-R-K. That's the unpardonable sin. Do you know what the unpardonable sin in Islam is? It is to profess that Jesus is God. And in some Islamic countries, if you say that, you can be put to death on the spot. It's blasphemy. It's the unpardonable sin. It's shirk to say that Jesus is God. Well, how, how can we have it both ways? Allah has no son. God of the Bible does. It can't be. That's a distinction. And it's definitely a difference for these two gods. Also, Allah never provides security for his followers. If you read the history of Muhammad, and there are histories out there, if you read his story, he never had the security that he would really ever go to heaven. Never did. He died in a state of uncertainty. You can read his words in his biography. He never had assurance. Because here's what Muslims believe. They believe in the end time it's all up to Allah. They can never know for sure unless they die as a martyr by blowing themselves and other people up. That's the only assurance of going to heaven and having 72 dark-eyed virgins ministering to you forever. Sounds a lot like Mormonism, doesn't it? It's a man's religion. And it's man-made religion. But if you read... This is what they believe, that Allah is going to take all your good works and put them on one side of a scale and all the bad stuff on the other side. And depending on the way it tips on that day, that determines if you go to heaven or not. And even Muhammad himself had no assurance. I don't want to belong to a faith like that. I want to know that I know that I know that I know when I put my head on the pillow at night, if I should die before I wake, that I'm going to be in the presence of Almighty God standing before the throne. Christianity offers that. Well, there's another reason that Allah can't be God. Allah is not intimate with His followers. You never hear a Muslim sing, singing this song, Allah loves me, this I know, for the Koran tells me so. They don't picture Allah like that. Allah is a God that's up there. They can't know Him personally. There's no personal relationship. There's no intimacy at all. How different, King David said in Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why, David? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Allah's not intimate with his followers. And one last thing, just a point of comparison. Allah, Allah never supported the idea of the cross. Muslims don't believe in the cross. They have the crescent. And they believe that it was not Jesus Christ that died on the cross, but Judas Iscariot that died on the cross. And they'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you in debating that. That's what the Koran teaches. Can't be the same God impossible you know I believe that Satan intentionally has put all these distortions out there for one purpose that is to confuse people and a lot of people today are serving a false God or a false image of God because his identity has been stolen by all these distortions and some people just throw up their hands in desperation and they say all religions are wrong who knows what's right there's so many religions religion is the problem with the world and therefore, I don't want anything to do with any religion. And they throw up their hands in desperation. Simply because God's identity has been stolen. Now, here's the last thing I want to share with you this morning. And it's the good news. I like to end with good news. Amen? The declaration of God. 
Paul told the philosophers at Myers Hill, Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim, I preach, I declare, I want to show you, I want to demonstrate to you. And then he goes on to describe the true identity of the true and the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, the God of our Christian faith. What does he say about God? Number one, he says that God is a going God. Going, G-O-I-N-G. He's a going God. Always, always God has been busy. He's an on-the-go God. Paul says in verse 24 of chapter 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, he's a going God, he's a doing God. Verse 25, he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. That means that God is involved in his creation. He didn't wind it up like a top and take a vacation eternally. He's right there. His hand is still on this world. He's still guiding and directing nations. It may not look like it, but I promise you God has a plan and God has a purpose. And everything that's happening internationally and even nationally in our country is under the supervision of Almighty God. That's His identity. He's still in charge. He's still sustaining us every single day. If God took a vacation this morning, none of us would be here. We would perish instantly. If God just simply took one day off. The Bible says this. Look at verse 28. For in him we live and move and exist, King James, have our being. In him. There's a little boy who's praying his bedtime prayers. And he prayed for grandma and grandpa, and mom and dad, brother, sister, all the folks at church, all the missionaries around the world, all the Gideons. He prayed for all of them. And then he said this. And God, take good care of yourself because if anything happens to you, we're all sunk. Amen? Take care of yourself, God. We need you. He is a going God. Here's another thing. God is also a gracious God. Now, Paul wanted these philosophers at Mars Hill, these highly educated men of letters, to know that God wanted them to be saved by His grace. Throughout the Bible, God is pictured as a God who offers mercy and grace. Now, it's true that He did destroy entire nations in the Old Testament. He ordered their demise in the Old Testament. And some people really get stumped by that. And I understand that. Here's what you've got to remember. Before God judged, He always offered grace. He always called those nations to repentance. But over and over again, they rejected, they rejected, and they rejected. And to annihilate sin and to remove that influence from His people and from His world, sometimes He would wipe out entire cultures. And entire countries in the Old Testament. But always grace precedes judgment. For example, Noah. It was a wicked world. And the world was going to be destroyed by floodwaters. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah and his little family, eight and all, they were saved. They were redeemed. They were kept safe all by grace. You know what? I'm not really amazed that God would wipe out these unrepentant cultures of the past. I'm not really amazed by that. What amazes me is that He's not wiped us out yet with our unfaithfulness, our sinfulness, and our lack of repentance. That's what I stagger at. God, why haven't you wiped us out yet? We, de we deserve judgment the way that we're living. So God is a gracious God. Here's another one. God is a godly God. That's the most repetitive. He's a godly God. Verse 30. Listen to what the Bible says. And God commands all people everywhere to repent. Why? Because He's a holy, perfect, just, godly God. Verse 31 of chapter 17. Because He has set a day on which He is going to judge the world in righteousness. Now don't get confused. God is a God of mercy and grace. But God is also a God of judgment. When His mercy and His grace is rejected over and over and over again, a last resort for a loving God is to send judgment. Always grace precedes judgment. You know what's missing in our society today? The fear of God. That's an old-fashioned statement. My grandmother, bless her heart, she was a charter member of Grace Baptist Church in Charlotte. She gave me my first Bible, one of those little Bibles with a zipper on it, a little cross. Remember those? Red letter edition. I thought, man, these red letters are really important, and they are. 
And I carried that little Bible. She was the first one to ever tell me about Jesus. It took 20 years before I came to Christ. But I'd go visit her in the rest home, and she'd say, Buddy, you know what's wrong with our world? You know why all this bad stuff's happening? Do you know why it seems like that our nation's going to hell in a handbasket? Even back then she was saying that. She says it's because people no longer fear God. They no longer have an awe and a reverence for God. I want to tell you something. God is not the man upstairs. Okay? He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big kahuna. God is holy. God is awesome in majesty. God is awesome in righteousness. And one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of this God, the true and the living God. Fear of God is missing. Remember when Isaiah went to church and he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the seraphim were encircling the throne what were they singing? Holy, holy, holy. They didn't sing love, 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 or great, 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 powerful, powerful, powerful. Holy, holy, holy. By the way, some folks tell me, you know, I don't like those 7-Eleven songs. Songs that have seven words, we sing them 11 times, because I don't like repetition. Well, what are they doing in Isaiah chapter 6? They're repeating, holy, holy, holy. So if you don't like repetition songs, you may not like it in heaven. Just telling you. Now, if they're just repeating words that don't mean anything, that's a whole different ballgame, amen? But if they're singing about the true and the living God, even if it's repetitive, it's holy, 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 holy. One last thing I want to share with you, right out of this same context, the declaration of God. Our God's a good God. Oh, man, he's a gracious God. He's a going God. He's a godly God, but he's a good God. Look at verse 31, chapter 17. Paul talks about judgment, but he quickly points out that he's provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That's good news. Jesus died, and Jesus what? On the third day, rose again. And Paul brings that out in the message he preaches at Mars Hill. Now, the fact that God would send Jesus in the first place shows he's a good God. He gave his only begotten son. The fact that he allowed that son to go through all the shame and all the persecution and then to be nailed to a Roman cross, God's a good God. And then the fact that he allowed him to be raised again so that he can live in your heart and my heart as Lord and Savior, that means he's a really good God. Do you know the goodness of God? I've had so many people talk to me across the years as a pastor, and they say, he can't be a good God. Look what happened to me. If he was a good God, why did he let this happen? He could have stopped this. He's not a good God. You know what the Bible says in Psalm 34? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Jesus said this to the rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? There's only one who's good. Only God is good. I want you to say something with me right now, okay? I want you to say this. God is good, God is good. No, matter no matter what. God is good. God is good. Go ahead. All right, there you go. That's the interactive part of the program. All right, very good. Let's try it one more time. God is good. No, there you go. Now we got it. Do you believe that or did you just say that? I believe that with all my heart. God is good. Now sometimes it's hard to see the good. Last Sunday in the hospital, it was hard for me to see the good. Okay, I'll just be honest with you. But I knew in my heart that God was still on the throne. It was a tough week because my son was a primary donor he was a perfect match. We had 10 or 12 people from this church who volunteered to give a kidney to me. And I got to tell you something, that's humbling. And every one of them failed to be a match. 
But my son was a perfect match. And last week they told me that they couldn't accept him because of his blood pressure. Now they've recalled my daughter and this week hopefully she's going to be reconsidered as a match. I need a kidney. I really do. I can't make it happen. I wouldn't dare ask anybody to do that. But I've got to believe in a God who's good and a God who's on the throne and a God who can provide a perfect kidney at the perfect time for His glory and for His praise. And you know what? If He doesn't, I'm just going to go home and be with Him. And I'm like Paul. It's a far better thing. Do you know the good God, the real God? Is He a living part of your life? Whoops, excuse me. If not, He can be this morning, and you can simply pray and ask Him to be your Lord and your Savior. We'll be glad to share with you how you can do that, or you can pray in your own heart. And then just check the little box that says, I gave my heart to Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ today as my Lord and Savior. And you can do that right where you are. We'll be glad to follow up with you and share with you every way we can. Maybe you're going through a valley right now. And maybe it's hard at this point to really see the goodness of God. But just like Zach said, God is a good God. And He's given us a good promise. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. That has to come from a good God. Would you come and pray today? I just believe that God's got something special in store in this invitation time as we make decisions and commitments to Him. Let's stand together. We're going to pray, then we're going to sing, and then you're free to come. Our Father, we're so grateful, Lord, that you are a good, loving God, a just, holy, majestic, powerful God. And Father, today I pray for every person in this place that just needs to know that. Maybe they need to know you for the very first time in their heart and life. Or maybe they just need to know you in the circumstance they're walking through right now. But God, make yourself known in a real powerful, personal, intimate way. Lord, we look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Know, God, how we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing.